Hello, my name is Matt Hayes and I'm a research assistant at the University Museum of Zoology in Cambridge. I'm talking to you from the insect storerooms behind the scenes, which as you can see behind me are full of cabinets, which are in turn full of drawers, which have rows and rows of insect specimens. We actually estimate there's probably around a million insect specimens stored in this room. As we've been shut to the public for such a long time and we can't do in-person tours of the stores, I've made one for you remotely and videoed some of my favourite drawers of specimens, so I hope you enjoy. So my research mainly looks at UK butterflies, so I'm going to be biased and I wanted to show you some, some specimens of these species. And here we have two drawers of two different, very important UK species, which are particularly important to the local area in Cambridgeshire. So if I zoom in on the one on the left, this is a drawer of large copper butterflies. You can see on the far left of this drawer, there's also two columns of small copper, but the rest are the larger large copper species. And then if we move to the right, these are the beautiful swallowtail butterflies. And again, all of these specimens were caught and uh, collected from, from the UK. What's cool though is that also the large copper and swallowtail specimens, many of them were actually collected from very close to where the University Museum of Zoology is in and around Cambridgeshire. But what's kind of more intriguing is that actually the large copper is now extinct in the UK and the swallowtail butterfly is extinct in the county. You can now only find it in the wetlands of Norfolk in this country. So what we have here is a really, really strong example of a, of a record of change. These historical museum specimens were collected from the local area and you can no longer find them, either in the country or in the county. And this is a really nice demonstration of the importance of museum collections for recording this measure of change over time. And it lets us extend our data sets back beyond living memory to see the true extent of species declines in the UK. And once you see which specimens and which species have declined, you can then begin to think, okay, why? Why have they dropped in number? And what can we do about this to help other species and potentially bring them back? Well, both the large copper and the swallowtail butterfly are wetland specialists. I'll just zoom in here so you can get a better view of some of them. You will see actually as well, uh, there's some variation here. So we've got males and females um, are slightly different in their, in their coloration. So the males are the ones that have more kind of block orange to their color and the females are more checkered. And then here, um, these, I'll just point at them. These ones are actually upside down. So you're seeing the underwing of, uh, of the wings there as well. So you get a variety of things that you can see. As I was saying, these species are both wetland specialists. And it turns out that around about the time the last large coppers were found in the country in around Cambridgeshire. The last large extensive area of wetland in the southeast of England in this area of the country was drained. So it makes sense that as the habitat of the species disappeared, so too were the species that, that depended on it. It makes sense that they also followed suit. So it looks like the habitat, their wet fenland disappearing is what caused these beautiful butterflies to also disappear. The, um, the swallowtail butterfly held on a bit longer, into about the mid-1900s, I believe. But this, too, was lost from the wetlands. But what can be done now is, with that information that we know they rely on this wetland habitat, we can try to bring this habitat back. So there's various conservation organisations, such as the Local Wildlife Trust, who are undergoing large habitat restoration projects in the local area, such as with the Great Fen project, where they're trying to work with farmers to re-wet landscapes, link up old fragments of wetlands that still exist, and work with the farmers to see how they can still farm on this, this wet fenland as well, so that agriculture and biodiversity can, can both benefit. And what's cool is that hopefully the swallowtails here on the right, they might be able to come back from, from Norfolk and make their way back into Cambridgeshire. And the large copper, these are still, these still survive on the continent. 
in other areas of Europe. So although they've been extinct from the UK, we might still be able to bring them back with a translocation or something like that if the habitat is ready for them. So this is one of my favourite drawers of specimens in the insect collection because these species look quite different to anything we really find in the UK. If I zoom in, you'll see that many of them, off of the top of their head, have this kind of strange protruding appendage. And some here even have like this really, really obvious kind of red bulbous end to them as well, which looks very odd. And maybe if it wasn't for that appendage on the top of their head, they might superficially look a bit like maybe butterflies or moths. But these are actually more closely related to things like aphids and shield bugs that we get in the UK. But these are just large relatives from places like China and Central America. And these are actually lantern flies or lantern bugs. So weirdly, not all insects are actually bugs. These, this group, which the lantern flies, the aphids and the shield bugs belong to, um, belong to the order of Hemiptera. And this is what is known as true bugs. So all bugs are insects, but not all insects are bugs. And this really odd appendage on the, the front of their, their head is what gives them the name lantern bugs. So weirdly, this appendage doesn't actually light up, but one of the first descriptions uh, that was written about them said that it did, and it actually said that you could even read a book by the light that was emitted from it. So that's where the name lantern bug or lantern fly comes from. Not really sure why it was thought that that was the case, because they, they don't light up. Um, Perhaps in some of the locations where these species are found, there's also bioluminescent beetles and things that do light up, so maybe they got a bit confused. Um, but certainly a really, really cool adaptation. And my favourite one of the species, if we zoom in on this one, is very aptly named the peanut-headed lanternbug. And you can see why, because it really does look like it's just got a giant peanut along the top of its head. So I'm going to try and move my hand into frame to just point out. So that's the peanut there, but its head, its eyes, are actually just here. It's not exactly known why they have these appendages on the, the front of their body, I, I believe. I think both females and males have these strange appendages in some species, so it don't, doesn't look to be sexually selected. Um, one theory I've, suggested, I've heard suggested is that it's to distract predators away from the true head. So for example, if we look at this specimen again, imagine you're a predator trying to come in and make a killing blow, it, it normally makes sense to aim for the head, because if you do that you tend to kill your prey. And normally the head is the large bulbous bit on the end of the body. But here in this specimen, this is what the predator might assume is the head. It could come in and nip it off and, and go away with that part of the body, which obviously isn't great for the lanternfly, but it might actually keep its head, which is here. So it could be that it just distracts predators away from the really important bits of the body. For the peanut-headed lanternfly, I've also heard that potentially it makes it look bigger and more scary, even that it might almost look like it's got teeth down the side of that peanut shape. And apparently some people suggest if you squint really hard it looks a bit like the head of a lizard or something like that. I think you have to have a good imagination for that. But again, makes it look big, distracts the predator away from the, the real head of the specimen. So a very cool selection of species there that I think look very different from other things that we normally see in the UK and this part of the world. These beautiful, huge insect specimens are Hercules beetles, a type of rhinoceros beetle. Again, if I zoom in on one specimen here and put my hand in view, you can see just how large this species is. You'll also be able to see that there seems to be quite a lot of variation between them, and the ones with these huge horns on their front, well these are the males, and then the ones lacking those horns, such as this one, are the females. So this is a sexually dimorphic trait where the males have these ornaments to impress the females but also to compete for females as well. So they will try to use these horns. If I go to one side you might actually be able to see as well they've got lower horns as well. It's a bit of a weird shot to show you. But yeah, you can just about see that. So they kind of almost use these horns a little bit like mandibles, like jaws and they can try and pick up and wrestle the other males to, to compete for a mate. There's an Attenborough documentary on a, on a different uh, species. So these are 
these are rhinoceros beetles, but there's a, there's a beetle called the Darwin beetle, which I think is a type of very large stag beetle, which has similar very, very large mandibles. And the males, again, use these to wrestle with one another and find a female. And what normally happens is a female will be on a branch up a very, very tall tree, and the males will start crawling up this tree. And on the way, if they find another male, they'll try and pick them up and, and drop them off and throw them off the tree to compete for a female. And this should mean that the strongest male gets to the top and is able to mate. But what sometimes happens as well, which the Attenborough documentary shows, is quite, quite amusing, is that the habit of throwing off competitors dies really hard. So what happens is that sometimes the male then mates with the female, picks her up, and throws her off a tree. So what you have is a successful male by himself at the top of a tree. Um, it seems that his, the beetles still manage to pass on their, their genetics, and that the female, the female doesn't die, I should mention that, they... Um, have very hard exoskeletons so they can survive the fall and they can actually fly but it is quite amusing that they've adapted to compete in this way and then they get to the top as victors and throw off the mate. These I think you'll agree are some absolutely stunning butterflies. These are birdwing butterflies and I believe most of these are found in Southeast Asia, Australasia and that kind of region of the world. And what you can see here is that they have quite extreme sexual dimorphism. So the very colourful specimens are the males. You've got the very bright blue, green, and yellowy orange. And then beneath them you have the larger females. And this is often the way in the natural world that the males have to try and be vibrant and show off to gain the approval and gain the attraction of a, of a mate. If I move my hand into shot, you'll get an idea of how big these specimens are. So really pretty hefty sized butterflies. However, these are not the larger species. The, the birdwing genus, or Ornithoptera, is, is the largest genus of, uh, of butterfly in the world. But there is a species we don't have in this collection called the Queen Alexandra birdwing, which is even larger than these butterflies. And that can grow up to be, I think, about 30 centimeter long wingspan, the female, so really colossal. And some of the first specimens of those that were captured, uh, I think, are held in the Natural History Museum in London. And at the time, the individuals going out to collect them were actually mainly searching for larger vertebrates, and especially birds. And back in the day, if you wanted to catch a bird, you tend to have a, a pistol out with you and you'd go out shooting. So these, these individuals saw, high up in the canopy, some large creature flapping its wings. So they took aim and they shot at them and they brought down butterflies with guns. <laughs> um, so I think the original ones are actually in the Natural History Museum in London and they still have the kind of the buckshot peppering from the, from the, uh, the bullets that went through the specimens. So yeah, an unconventional way to catch butterflies using pistols, but I think it kind of represents how impressively large these specimens are that they were collected in the same way as you would actually go about collecting bird specimens. Here we have a draw of something that is very, very different. Potentially these might be a little scary to some people, but these are actually tarantula hawk wasps. And if I zoom in on one of the largest specimens and put my hand in frame, you can see quite how large these species are. Now they're called tarantula hawk wasps because these wasps actually predate tarantulas. So you can even see, if I zoom in closer, that big stinger coming out of the end of the abdomen there. And what these species do is they will find a tarantula and they will sting it with that impressive stinger and that will paralyze the tarantula. What they then do is they will carry or crawl back to a brooding chamber with the tarantula, dragging it along behind them. There's another very large specimen here. And then they will bury that tarantula in the brood chamber and lay their eggs on it. Now the eggs of the tarantula hawk wasp will then hatch and they will rather gruesomely start to devour the tarantula alive. Now that does sound pretty gruesome but from a natural selection perspective it's very clever because in keeping the tarantula alive the food source for their larvae lasts for longer and the larvae has actually been shown to leave stuff like the vital organs of the tarantula till last so it keeps it alive even longer. As I say, quite gruesome, but it is very clever. 
Another quite cool but potentially a little bit of a scary fact about uh, these tarantula hawk wasps is that they have a very painful sting. So there is a researcher called Schmidt who must have been quite a peculiar fellow but he took it upon himself to be stung or bitten by all of the most painful insects in the world and he created something called the Schmidt Pain Index where he ranked in a lot of detail how painful all these different insect stings were and he also described them almost like wine tasting notes so the tarantula hawk wasp came in at second on that list it's the second most painful sting the most painful sting is the the bullet ant which apparently gives you about two days of hallucinogenic pain whereas the tarantula hawk wasp only gives you about five minutes but of extremely intense pain and there's uh, there's academic papers that actually suggest if you get stung by one of these what you should do is you should just roll around on the floor and call for help because you'll be in so much pain that you can't really help yourself so getting someone else to help you is probably the best course of action. So quite an impressive wasp there that stings and prepares tarantulas for its offspring that has a very painful sting. I should say though you shouldn't really be, be afraid of them. They, they tend to stay away from people and try to get away from us before stinging as a last resort and you know it's, a, it's an impressive impressive adaptation that isn't really designed for humans and I think you can agree that it is quite a cool thing that these wasps predate tarantulas. This is another species of UK butterfly and is probably my favourite butterfly if not my favourite insect. It's one of the first species ever studied and it has a very very cool life cycle which first got me interested in it. So this is called the large blue butterfly if I zoom in here, you put my hand next to it, you can see it's actually not very large. But we have even smaller butterflies that are also blue in the UK. So by comparison, this is the large blue. We don't tend to be very imaginative with our names for species in this country. So this is the large blue. Sadly, the original UK population went extinct in 1979 and it had actually been declining for some time and this triggered research into the ecology and life cycle of the species so that we could better understand what was causing its decline. Unfortunately, yeah, that, that increased understanding of the requirements of the species came a bit too late for the original UK population. But what it did allow was that a couple of years later, the species was actually reintroduced successfully from Sweden. And as I mentioned, the really cool thing about this species is its amazing life cycle. And that, as it turned out, was actually the, the clue that we needed for how we could better conserve this species. So the life cycle starts out fairly normal with the, the adult female large blue butterfly uh, laying her eggs on a specific food plant. And in the case of the large blue butterfly, that specific food plant is wild thyme. The eggs then hatch after about a week and the tiny caterpillars then proceed to feed on the wild thyme, but they don't do much growing. And after about two weeks, they then do something very strange. They fall off their plant to the floor. And for most species, this would be a disaster because the caterpillar would have fallen away from its food and it would starve. But then something really cool and quite surprising happens. Worker ants actually discover the caterpillar, pick it up and adopt it and carry it back to their nest. And in the UK, it is one specific species of worker ant that does this. It's a, a red ant uh, called Mimica sabaletti. As it turns out, the caterpillars of the large blue butterfly mimic the red ant. So what they do is they have chemicals on their outer cuticles, so their hard outer skin, that resemble the chemicals on the skin of the ant, on the cuticle of the ant. And the caterpillars also make the call of the queen ant to raise their status. So what happens is the ants come across the caterpillar and think they've lost one of their own children. They think it's escaped from the nest. They pick it up, carry it home, and protect it in the nest. And what happens next? Well, the caterpillar of the large butterfly is a terrible guest. It proceeds to eat the real young of the ants. In doing so, it grows to be about 20 times its original size, so it gets to be way bigger than the ants that look after it. But the ants are none the wiser. They just think one of their children is doing really, really well, and all the others are disappearing, so they continue to look after it. And after about nine months of gorging itself on the ant's young, the caterpillar pupates, and a month or so after that, it emerges as an adult 
butterfly from the ant's nest. So really, really cool. I don't think anyone who would see a, a blue butterfly in the field would maybe think that this form of social parasitism, kind of like a cuckoo bird, was going on around them. As it turned out, we didn't properly understand how specific and how complicated that relationship with ants was. So now, it, for conservation in the UK, we actually mainly look after the host ant. So Mimicus abiletti, that red ant that hosts the large blue in this country, it needs really warm ground to survive, otherwise it's outcompeted by other ants. So what we do in the, in the UK is we have mowing and grazing regimes that keep the grass really short and keep the ground nice and warm from the sun so it isn't shaded. And this supports the ant. And what we think happened from the 1950s onwards is that traditional cattle grazing reduced and also myxomatosis wiped out a lot of our rabbit populations. So grass across the country just grew up by a few centimetres. And that was enough to shade the ground and cool it so that the host ant couldn't survive and it was outcompeted. And without the host ant, you also lose the butterfly that it supports. But now supporting the host ant means that the large blue butterfly is doing really well and we actually have some of the densest populations anywhere in the world now. And that's since it, has, since it went extinct and we reintroduced it. So I think this is an awesome species because it's a great example of how conservation can work and if the, if the time and effort and research goes into understanding what species require then reintroduction attempts can be successful and it also just shows you how complex and interconnected all the wildlife around us really is.